It's early April and we are at the Washington Hilton Hotel where the Organization of American Historians is meeting, a very large convention, and we're in the book publishing section and we're going to introduce you to one of the authors who's being featured here by Cornell Press. John Hench has a new book coming out called Books as Weapons. What an interesting concept. <laughs> it tells the story of what? Well, it uh, tells the story of uh, a joint effort by the American government and the book publishers to help win the peace as well as the war, but also to provide the opportunity for publishers to get their books into international markets in ways that they never had before. Which war was this? This was the Second World War, I'm sorry. I thought everybody knew that, of course. <laughs> and, and how did the concept get developed in the first place? Uh, well, the notion of books as weapons is, is in a way an extension of the uh, old adage, the pen is mightier than the sword, that, that, um, that ideas are important um, in fighting wars, and they can be um, ideas that are, are um, uh, both to be defended and assailed. Uh, so the Council on Books in Wartime, which was a, a, war, a wartime uh, publishers organization, came up with the idea of a slogan, books as weapons in the wars, war of ideas, and that was adopted nationally by President Roosevelt. Something like that ever happened today? Well, uh, that's a good question. I kind of conclude my book on speculating on whether that could happen. The uh, World War II efforts um, to, in effect, influence public opinion abroad through the use of books was fairly big during the Cold War, and it pretty much died out um, in the early late 70s or early 80s. Uh, whether or not it would be effective in the Middle East today um, is not known, but there is somebody who's actually working on trying to get good American books, uh, classics like the Federalist Papers, into Arabic, translated into Arabic, uh, Arabic and Persian and so on for use in the Middle East. But that example, I would guess, is a private initiative? That is, but uh, the ones I'm talking about during the Second World War were very much partnerships between the federal government in various of its agencies and the book publishers to do a job of great importance for the war uh, and the publishers found that they could do well by doing good. I, nobody has any doubt that they weren't patriotically motivated by all of this but clearly they were trying to uh, uh, plan for the future of, of their industry after the war where the notion of, of being able to sell in foreign markets uh, looked much more promising than it ever had before, in part because their great rival internationally, the British, their book trade had been so uh, greatly affected by the war, just really a disaster for them. So it gave them the opportunity to do good and then hopefully do well after exactly. the war exactly. was over. But they did well during the war too because the government paid all the expenses of getting these American books into the hands of European civilians. Uh, as soon after liberation from the Nazis as possible and um, thus were able to get their wares into the hands of Europeans. Were the books translated? Some were, some weren't. Um, the, the books that wound up being the principal part of this project were books that were published expressly for this effort. Uh, they were called overseas editions and there was a smaller series published in, uh, by the U.S. though in England uh, called transatlantic editions. And some of them were left uh, untranslated in English because these books were meant to be read by elites, the leadership community uh, emerging after the war on the notion that these people would be in a position to really affect uh, members of their family, members of their businesses, members of their community. So it was a way of getting more bang for the buck. Rather, uh, they were using magazines and newspapers for a more mass appeal. Um, and they figured that English would be a language that many people in Germany and in France and particularly in places like Scandinavia and the Low Countries would know. But they were also translated into French, Italian, German and Dutch. How were the titles selected? They were selected um, pr principally to meet uh, very important and specific propaganda goals. And it was an, uh, a task that was shared by the Council on Books and Wartime, um, which was the trade organization, and the Office of War Information, which was the chief government propaganda agency. 
The uh, process was very elaborate, went on forever, which delayed the start of the program, actually, among other things. Uh, and Chester Kerr, who was the uh, head of the project for the Office of War Information, said that uh, uh, virtually everybody but the janitor had a hand in selecting the books. Would we be familiar with some of the titles today? Uh, many of them, yes. Um, the other thing that um, governed the selection of the books was it was decided that these books should be books that were, for the most part, recently published, that is published during the war, meaning, number one, that they would not have been available to Europeans or people in Asia or anywhere else during the war because of uh, embargoes and, and uh, just the conditions of war. But also it meant that uh, these were uh, current books, in many cases, books that had done very well in the U.S. Some had won Pulitzer Prizes, some had um, been um, best on the bestseller list, and also uh, uh, in, uh, in one way or another, very book of the month club selections. And so this was an opportunity for the publishers, of course, to get these books that were um, uh, bestsellers and, and hot literary properties for them uh, free of charge into the European markets. Interesting. So it wasn't the American classics, but it was contemporary American no. culture. No, and uh, it could, it might have been. Um, but the whole, the main point was that they wanted books that were being read in the United States as well, which would give the notion, uh, would make it much less obvious that these were works of propaganda. The British did much the same thing, and mainly they commissioned books to be written as propaganda. What we did was to select books already in print that could serve propaganda purposes, but could not be assailed by Nazis or even eventually communists for being, uh, you know, the um, work of the, of, of the U.S. government. Take effort on, exactly. our, on our country's part. Yeah. Well, you said that some of the titles would be recognized today. Can you cite any of them? Uh, one, uh, there were very few novels. Um, uh, one was For Whom the Bell Tolls by Ernest Hemingway. Um, another was A Walk in the Sun by a, an army PFC about a, um, a particular uh, operation, I think, in Italy. And one that, I don't know if it's read so much anymore, but it was very popular for a long time, William Soroyan's The Human Comedy. Uh, and that was a book, a novel, about a young uh, telegraph, uh, Western Union messenger boy in uh, a small town in California who uh, has to uh, tell many of uh, his neighbors and friends that one of their sons or daughters was killed in the war. Um, there were, as I said, the books were chosen uh, for very specific propaganda reasons. The Human Comedy and another book called How America Lives was there, were chosen primarily to give Europeans, including Germany, uh, the notion of, of something about uh, ordinary Americans. What we needed to do was to really counteract years of Nazi propaganda and censorship that, uh, in addition to, of course, proclaiming the great superiority of German culture and German might, belittled American culture as indistinguished and crass, Americans as money-hungry uh, business people, and gangsters. Gangsterism, uh, the gangster quality of American life, was very broadly uh, preached by Goebbels' propaganda machines, but also had been introduced to uh, Europeans by American films. Well, I guess the question is that given the hardships that people endured under living under Axis rule, I, did people really need this or was there just a, a Well, these a sense were not, these books weren't, weren't getting them to them until liberation. Uh, but they, they had gone through years Exactly, of, uh, exactly. And so it was necessary, as one, one official said, to disintoxicate them from, from these years. But obtaining much, um, I mean, it was, of course, one would, would obtain. Do you question the government's premise in that regard? Uh, I mean, no. Do you see this as a necessary program? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Um, yes, for any number of reasons. I don't know that it, uh, um, it you know, it was, uh, it, it could have been on a larger scale, perhaps. Uh, that it was on any scale at all is quite remarkable. Was a similar effort being made of getting films so that it was yes. not, were many aspects yes. of culture that were being touched? Yes, there were films that went through, there was a film bureau that uh, of the government, uh, film, or the Office of War Information also had a film agency, not just books, and they were the ones to get, to get into, uh, into there. But in a way, it's interesting that the, uh, it, it was 
It was decided that books, which the Office of War Information proclaimed as being the most enduring propaganda of all, because they would sit on shelves rather than be read like a newspaper or a magazine and then discarded, and uh, they could be the subject of what a lot of scholars are calling um, the building of reading communities, uh, a, uh, a, a leader in, of, of, um, of newly liberated France in some small town might create a kind of reading community where he would tell uh, people about what he read in these books or would pass them on and they would discuss them uh, at all.